America and the app. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And as a reminder, Words on Film is the show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on some real community access TV or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them, I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, on my own personal page this time, unfortunately not on the Boston Free Radio Facebook page because of technical difficulties. But either Either way you can join me, I'm glad you can join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. I have five new movies to review for you for this show. First, though, I'm going to get into my normal first segment, What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. And what's really surprising is that a movie that's been out for three weeks took the number one spot from the number one movie last week. So, a little bit of a spoiler... The number one movie last week was Rampage, starring Dwayne Johnson. This week, it's A Quiet Place, which debuted at number two when it came out, I think, uh, when it came out three weeks ago, but it took the number one spot this past weekend, having made $20.9 million just this past weekend. Against a budget of just $17 million, A Quiet Place has so far grossed $131.3 million, here in the States, and internationally it has grossed $207.2 million, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Number two at the box office was number one last week, Rampage, earning $20.1 million. So even though A Quiet Place took the number one spot, it didn't take it by much. But Rampage is still doing okay particularly given its budget. Against a budget of $120 million, Rampage has so far grossed $65.7 million here in the United States, and around the world it has so far grossed $283.5 million, making it not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is already a certified hit. I Feel Pretty is the number one highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it's number three at the box office, having grossed $16 million against a budget of $32 million. So I feel pretty doesn't have a huge budget to for it to compensate for. However, it has made half its money back. It's not a hit yet here in the States, but it's still off to a pretty good start. Around the world, it has made $18.4 million, which means I Feel Pretty is not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. Super Troopers 2 also debuted this week, the number two highest grossing debut movie, which is number four at the box office, having grossed $15.2 million against a budget of $13.5 million. And we're going to talk more about Super Troopers 2's, Super Troopers 2's way of getting funds together. I'm, I'm going to talk all about that in my review later on the show. But the good news is that Super Troopers 2 has made all its money back in a single weekend and is a tentative hit at the box office and has a very good chance of eventually becoming certified. Truth or Dare was number three at the box office last week. This week it fell to number five, having grossed $7.8 million just at the U.S. box office this past weekend. However... Against a budget of $3.5 million, it has not only made more than twice its money back this weekend alone, it has also made $30.3 million so far in its two-week run, and $38.2 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Ready Player One is a movie that's struggling a lot more than I thought it it would. Internationally, it's doing okay, but it's number six at the box office this weekend in its fourth week in release, having grossed $7.4 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $175 million, Ready Player One has so far grossed $126.1 million here in the States and $521.9 million worldwide. So Ready Player One is doing very well internationally here in the states it hasn't made its money back yet thereby making it not a hit yet here in the states but around the world it is certified which is encouraging and it's also interesting to note that ready player one has been in theaters for less than half the time that black panther has and has grossed about probably a little less than half of what 
Black Panther has grossed internationally. And as you might guess, Black Panther is not in the top five, as I just divulged the top five, but it's still in the top ten, and that film is coming up soon. Blockers is number six, seven, excuse me, at the box office, having grossed $6.8 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a budget of $21 million, Blockers has so far grossed $48.1 million here in the States and $67.8 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world, which I kind of knew it would do from last week. Black Panther, I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Here's how, by much. Black Panther grossed $4.9 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $200 million, Black Panther has so far grossed 60, excuse me, 680, excuse me again. $681.4 $681.4 million here in the States, and around the world has so far made $1.325 billion. Now, there's no guarantee that Avengers Infinity War will top Black Panther, but considering that Black Panther is in Avengers Infinity War, as is all other Marvel Cinematic Universe characters so far, it has a very good chance of topping Black Panther. But I'm not going to say whether or not it will, because, of course, I am a film critic, not a fortune teller. Traffic, spelled with the, ending with a K rather than a C, is number nine at the box office, the third highest grossing debut movie, but it made $3.9 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend against a budget of $4 million. Now, I don't have the information for how this movie is done internationally so far, but here in the States, it is not a hit yet, but is very, very close to becoming one. And will, it will probably become at least a tentative hit by next week if it is in the top 10. But, of course, I don't know if it will be. And finally, Isle of Dogs is getting some very well-deserved underground buzz. And it is number 10 at the box office, sliding from number 7 last week. But it made $3.5 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against an undisclosed budget, Isle of Dogs has so far made $39.6 million internationally and $24.4 million here in the States. I don't have the budget, so I can't tell you what kind of hit this movie is yet, but the buzz is pretty good. Hey, Boston Free Radio fam. Next Monday, we will have local rap artist Jay Gooden, and he will be stopping by to interview with this guy, Fan Fan. Stay tuned for him. Also, check out our website. Listen to the recap interview with Sterling Tology Live that he had with Andrea of BLB. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Your favorite Boston Free Radio artists will be taking over the airwaves to bring you new and original content. Don't Hold Your Tongue, an SMC Speak Out, Sunday, June 10th from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., 12 straight hours of live performances, comedy, music, digital art, and more. Find out more and donate now online at supplementmedia.org. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is I Feel Pretty. This is the latest starring Amy Schumer, and it is directed by two writers who are actually making their directorial debut and are married in real life, Abby Cohn and Mark Silverstein. And for those of you who aren't familiar with their names, they are the writing partners behind the 1999 romantic comedy Never Been Kissed, starring Drew Barrymore, which is a movie that I didn't especially care for when I first saw it, but the more I've seen it on, on HBO and it being rerun on on television from time to time, the more I've really appreciated it. I I don't know why I didn't appreciate it when I first saw it, but maybe I kind of dismissed it as a girl's film. But either way, Never Been Kissed was good. And they also wrote the screenplays for 
he's just not that into you, which I haven't seen, but I haven't heard great things about. And also How to Be Single, which was a pretty decent romantic comedy. So here, I Feel Pretty is a PG-13 rated comedy starring Amy Schumer. And the reason I emphasize PG-13 is because Amy Schumer can be a pretty raunchy comedian sometimes, especially in movies like Trainwreck. But here she's in a more accessible comedy where she plays a woman who's struggling with insecurity and wakes up from a fall believing she is the most beautiful and capable woman on the planet, or so the description says. Her new confidence empowers her to live fearlessly, but what happens when she realizes her appearance never changed? So that's the summary of the movie in a nutshell. And Amy Schumer plays a woman who works for a a fashion company uh, in their online division, basically in a dark room where there's where she doesn't receive a lot of company other than from her introverted co-worker Mason, who's played in this movie by comic actor and character actor Adrian Martinez. And he's one of those guys who you don't know his name, but once you see his face, you could probably name at least five films he's been in. So Amy Schumer's character knows she's not pretty. And I've been kind of struggling to give you this review because I don't exactly want to rate Amy Schumer's looks from a scale of Phyllis Diller to Cecily Strong, but I I feel kind of compelled to because even though Amy Schumer does not look like a fashion model, far from it, she's not as unattractive as both her on-screen counterpart and also her stand-up comedian persona wants you to think she is. You know, I, I think she's I think she's prettier than she gives herself credit for, but let's not overdo it. And with that said, I'm going to leave Amy Schumer's level of attractiveness at that. But I, th- I think she was actually perfect for this role because if, if this was played by somebody like Anne Hathaway, it wouldn't work. So... Amy Schumer is believably real in in this movie, and I'm trying to use my words carefully because I don't want to fall into some male chauvinistic cliche. But in any event, she is dissatisfied with her look. She does have low self-esteem, and she goes to a spin class one day and then injures her head badly, only to wake up and look at herself in the mirror and see that she looks like the runway model she aspires to look like. But the movie makes a very fatal mistake in that... You see Amy Schumer looking in the mirror, and you see Amy Schumer staring, Amy Schumer's image staring right back at her. What the movie really should have done was shown you what Amy Schumer thought she looked like after that head injury. You know, it would have been the perfect opportunity. And we do have the technology in movies these days to have someone who's not a mirror image look right back at at somebody who looks completely different than them, almost like a Harpo Marx and Lucille Ball effect. And if if Amy Schumer's character in this movie woke up and thought she looked like Kate Upton, I would like to see Kate Upton in that mirror image. I I think that the audience is at least owed that much. So this, this movie missing that key opportunity put, puts the movie off on a relatively bad note. And as a matter of fact, there were plenty of perfect opportunities for Amy Schumer to see a more glamorized version of herself in, in the form of you know, Kate Upton or maybe even Jennifer Lawrence. If Jennifer Lawrence was able to make a cameo in this film as Amy Schumer's perceived mirror image, I thought that actually would have been both funny and surprising. But with that said, I actually do think Amy Schumer does well in this film, both playing a, a woman with low self-esteem who's down on herself because she's not getting the attention from men she thinks she deserves. And also, when she becomes more self-confident, I actually found Amy Schumer to be <laughs> quite attractive. It, it was pretty surprising. So I think that Amy Schumer sells both states of mind in this film really well. What 
really kind of puzzled me though was that once Amy Schumer hits her head and thinks she looks like this the supermodel, she begins a relationship with an, another uh, the main. Um, love interest in this film who's a guy named Ethan who's played by an actor named Rory Scoville and Rory Scoville is not a great looking guy he's a little shabby looking but you know I, I think he's a very approachable guy but I'm, I'm sort of thinking that if I had a head injury that resulted in me waking up looking in the mirror and thinking I look like you know Zac Efron or somebody I would I would probably go down Newbury Street or maybe pick up the improper Bostonian and start circling the most eligible singles list and just go after those women with <laughs> with no self-esteem issues at all. And it just kind of surprises me that Amy Schumer doesn't go after a, a great-looking guy like... Tom Hooper, who plays another character in this film. But I, I did think that th this movie was pretty good. I just thought there were some missed opportunities to see the world, or rather Amy Schumer's character herself through Amy Schumer's eyes after the accident. But it gets my rating of a checkout, because it's a lot better than the movie Snatched, and I actually thought it was a little less predictable than her film Trainwreck. So even though Amy Schumer's getting some online backlash, I still think she has star power in her. Man, do I love card night. You ready, boys? You got a king? Go, fish tag. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is WWE superstar Titus O'Neil. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Learn more at 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all. And yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us. Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be discussing for you is Super Troopers 2. This is the long-awaited sequel to the original movie from 2001. It's 2018 now, and they finally made a film. And interestingly enough, a sequel had been in the works or since 2006. And there was a time when the director of the film, Jay Chandrasekhar, who is a member of the Broken Lizard comedy troupe, actually intended Super Troopers, the, the sequel, to be actually a prequel. But I guess plans fell through for that, because Super Troopers 2 takes place years after the original Super Troopers film. And in this film, you find a lot of the members of the Spurberry Police Department taking on other jobs after a controversial incident with Fred Savage playing himself in the movie on a ride-along that resulted in him being seriously injured. And the movie should have actually started with the footage of Fred Savage on this ride-along, because I actually thought that that scene with Fred Savage was pretty funny, but they put it at the very end for some reason. But in any event, there are some members of the Spurberry Police Department, former members who are working in construction and also working in logging and, and other non-police related businesses. But in any event, Catherine O'Hagan, who's reprised in this film by Brian Cox, 
who played the role in the original Super Troopers, gathered the group to meet for a fishing trip in Canada. It's then that they meet up with Vermont Governor Jessman, who's played again in this movie as she was in the original movie by Linda Carter. And apparently there is a recent land survey where it was discovered that land in Canada, just above Vermont, was originally designated for the U.S., and Canada has agreed to hand over the land. So what Governor Jessman needs the original Super Troopers to do is to set up a a police department to take over this land from the Canadian Mounted Police in the region. So she invites the group to become state troopers again with the promise that they will become full-time officers should they succeed at this task. And it's a decent plot but once you figure out that the mayor of this this town that's being taken over by the the u.s that used to be a canadian town is a mayor by the name of guy lafranc who's played by rob Lowe, you pretty much know exactly how the story is going to go and that there will be a twist with governor lafranc especially when the the super troopers are going around getting a a lay of the land and they find that there is a brothel that's enthusiastically attended by governor lefranc and the scene in the brothel should have been funnier but once rob lowe literally plays with a male prostitute's penis in front of these uh police officers and for those of you who can't see me on the radio i am covering my face right now because it's kind of embarrassing to talk about that scene and you can imagine what it's like even watching it is in fact rob lowe not only strokes the guy's penis and it's actually shown on camera but he also kind of <laughs> plays it with it like it's a, it's a boxing bag and he, he says oh you got a good workout out of this eh? I'm, I'm i'm thinking to myself my god this movie is trying too hard and there's there are certainly uh, there are certainly times and places for penis jokes but when the the actors on the screen just overdo it and also an, another joke that's overdone here is somebody getting kicked in the balls. That happens probably about four or five times. You can't overdo a guy getting kicked in the balls. You, you kind of have to you, you have to space those jokes out. And here it seemed to happen at least five times during the movie, or at least during what I counted. And this being made by the Broken Lizard comedy group, there were plenty of funny scenes i thought the funniest scenes were actually when the troopers were pulling over people in the uh on the highway and in fact there's there's one part where two of the troopers actually pulled them over with with horses which i thought was was very funny and then there was another time when two of the troopers inhale (laughs) um Got a little distracted by the traffic noise there. They they inhale helium from balloons, and I thought that was great. Also, when they, they speak fake French, that was another good scene. But the problem was that these scenes individually were good on their own. And I think they would have been good for YouTube videos. But when here they seemed kind of shoehorned into the plot. As a matter of fact, the idea that canada would hand over land a a a thin stretch of land that might have belonged to the united states in this day and age with donald trump being so concerned over the border and allegedly too many illegal immigrants getting through this is something that would never happen today granted this film was, was was probably in production during obama's years but even then i i just think to myself who cares about a little patch of land that w- uh, originally belonged to the United States? If it, w- if it was one of the provinces like Newfoundland, yeah, maybe we'd be having a d- discussion there. But And especially if the area had oil. But here, th- there's just no motivation like that. And it, it would have even been maybe a little bit cliched, but certainly... A, a plot point that didn't feel contrived if there was an oil company that wanted to get in there and start digging as opposed to making the 
the access pipeline that's been so controversial over the last couple of years. So, Super Troopers 2, for a movie that actually started out being crowdsourced on on some website, I can't... It was Indiegogo. It was an Indiegogo crowdfunding that campaign that asked for $2 million, but ultimately raised $4.5 million. I think that it's great that the, these kind of independent films are funded this way, but unfortunately, they they should have had a better plot for this film. So it gets my rating of a strikeout. It has some laughs, but overall, I think it would have been better for a rental and maybe even a couple of YouTube clips than it was for an entire film. The plot twist was predictable. The Canadian jokes have been seen. I've seen another Hi, I'm Danica before. Patrick. Watching my nieces time. grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. And I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage, and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Best Friends. This is the latest movie from Tommy Wiseau and Greg Sestero. The script was written by Greg Sestero and stars him and Tommy Wiseau, who major film buffs, or maybe fans of the room, will immediately recognize as the co-stars of... The movie The Room, which is reputed to be the worst film of all time. And those of you who aren't as familiar with The Room are probably familiar with The Disaster Artist, which Greg Sestero wrote about the making of The Room, which was ultimately turned into a movie starring James Franco, Dave Franco, and... Seth Rogen. And The Disaster Artist was very well received, including by yours truly. And The Disaster Artist, the movie, was also nominated for an Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay, losing to the movie Call Me By Your Name. And I liked The Disaster Artist a lot more than Call Me By Your Name. I feel like the only film critic who didn't really like Call Me By Your Name. I gave him my rating of a checkout, but I wasn't crazy about it. But in any event, Best Friends is a movie whose title, you will notice at first glance, has parentheses around the R. So you could take the R out of Friends and the title would read Best Friends. Fiends. It's not the greatest title in the world, but I'm just going to call it Best Friends from here on out. And it's a movie about a homeless drifter in Los Angeles, played by Greg Sestero. And he plays a guy whose name is John Cortina. And he has a tragic past, but he eventually wanders around Los Angeles and finds a man named Harvey Lewis, who is played by Tommy Wiseau. And Harvey Lewis is a lonely mortician who meets John and in employing this young drifter, takes him on a wild journey, or at least that's according to the synopsis here. But Best Friends is a movie that's a little avant-garde, but rest assured, it is a lot better than The Room. But man, so many things were wrong with The Room that 
anything else that Greg Sestero and Tommy Wiseau could do is undoubtedly a, a step up from the room. So Best Friends is a little avant-garde in the sense that it has a little bit of a story, but a lot of times you don't quite know where it's going. With that said, it has a lot more tonal and storytelling consistency than The Room does. And after you've after these two have been in the worst movie of all time, which is on the bright side, as distinguishable as being in the best movie of all time, there's really nowhere else to go but up. But I gotta say, Best Friends was not a movie I was in love with, but I liked it. I actually thought that Tommy Wiseau himself was good in this movie because of the fact that in the room, Tommy Wiseau plays this all-American guy who's not American, who's in the movie very well liked by all those who are around him and what's interesting is that that doesn't fit Tommy Wiseau at all because Tommy Wiseau is a very 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 weird man he is appealingly weird as a matter of fact before I started doing the show I found a clip of him actually doing a mock audition to play the Joker, and it's a, it's a little bit of a scary video that also features an appearance by Greg Sestero, but it's actually really funny. He's he's actually he colors his long black black hair green, and he wears the similar Joker makeup as Heath Ledger wore in The Dark Knight, and he reads lines from both from Heath Ledger's Joker and from Jack Nicholson's Joker. It's a pretty funny video. So I think it goes to show you that if you put the right person in the right role, you'll get a pretty good performance here. And yeah, I, I was I never thought I'd say I was impressed by Tommy Wiseau in this film, but he plays a weird guy. He is a weird guy. So this was a film, this was a role he was pretty much meant to play. And Greg Sestero is is pretty good as, you know, the the antithesis to Tommy Wiseau's character in this film. I, I think this was kind of one of those roles that Greg Sestero was working towards his whole life. And I do think not only from seeing Greg Sestero on the big screen, in the room, and a few other uh, film and TV projects, I know he's a guy who has a lot of acting potential. And he was dealt a bad hand in meeting Tommy Wiseau and, and creating The Room, but I I actually did respect when I, when I saw him speak live at the Coolidge Corner Theater where I caught a screening of Best Friends, I respected the fact that he was known for making one of the worst films of all time, and he wanted to go up after that. And I I, I did really respect that. As a matter of fact, I thought one of the best parts of The Disaster Artist was Dave Franco's reimagine. I shouldn't say Dave Franco's portrayal of Greg Sestero. I thought Dave Franco, not James Franco, was the best part of The Disaster Artist because you could identify a lot more with Greg Sestero. He was a guy with a lot of ambition who came to Hollywood thinking he would take it on and like hundreds if not thousands of other artists in Los Angeles, he failed to meet those expectations. I thought Dave Franco, for an, art, for an actor who has made it, really reflected that very well. But But then again, of course... This movie is about, or rather, this review is about the movie Best Friends, not about The Disaster Artist or even The Room, but with, with these two having made one of the worst films of all time, you can't help but compare their new project to their old one. So, Best Friends had a story that kind of dragged a little bit. I wasn't sure exactly where it was going, but... Greg Sestero and Tommy Wiseau, all things considered, played very well off of each other. There was also a neat a supporting performance by a very beautiful young woman by the name of Kristen Stephenson Pino, who was not in the room at all. And also there's a cameo by comedian Paul Shear, who is in this film very briefly. And i got to tell you, man, I think that if Greg Sestero writes more stuff like this, 
his, his movies are going to get better and better, and I would like to see him actually succeed. As for Tommy Wiseau, well, if there are more weird man roles, I, I think he'd fit them very well. But Best Friends was actually a big surprise. It wasn't perfect, but I give the, mov- my, the movie my rating of a checkout, and I think fans of the room will like it too. In the wake of a disaster, what one thing can you send that will help people the most? A blanket, a tent, a sandbag, a doctor. Actually, if you send a monetary donation, you send all these things. Even a small donation can make a big impact and can quickly become exactly what people affected by disaster need most. In the wake of a hurricane, your monetary donation can make a huge difference to those in need. To donate, visit supporthurricanerelief.org. That's supporthurricanerelief.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. From the hub of the solar system to the world, bostonfreeradio.com. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Boston Come Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the black experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is Grace Jones' Bloodlight and Bami. So what is Bloodlight? I don't know. What is Bami? Bami is actually a dish that they serve in Jamaica, which is where the artist Grace Jones is from. Yeah, I, I should have emphasized that. This movie is entirely about the artist Grace Jones, who is a fashion icon, not to mention a singer. And she has had a pretty fascinating rise to fame. What's even more fascinating is her having staying power. Now, of course, she's not getting a lot of attention these days, particularly because Lady Gaga is as flamboyant and as gregarious, not to mention younger, than Grace Jones. But she still sells out concert venues all around the world in which she performs. And what's really amazing is that this film, Grace Jones, Blood, Light, and Bami, is a documentary. It's it's sort of a verite documentary, which means that it it's sort of a fly on the wall documentary. It doesn't it doesn't give you a synopsis of Grace Jones's career and life, even though I would like to see that kind of documentary someday. It it shows you kind of half and half her performing in concert and also her backstage not literally backstage although there there are plenty of moments where she is literally backstage but she also shows her going home to visit her family in jamaica as well as recording her newest album and also talking over the phone to various people including the reggae duo sly and robbie who are still around today surprisingly and what's really fascinating about grace jones is of course as i said her staying power and her stage presence and the fact that she will be 70 in just a couple of weeks yet she has a body that i'm sure a lot of 40 year old women would kill to have and now i've seen a lot of women in Hollywood age gracefully. Women like Jane Fonda and Raquel Welch. But I think Grace Jones would probably be envied by these women because Grace Jones doesn't look like she did in the 70s. But for a woman who's pushing 70, wow. <laughs> and there are moments in this movie, and it's 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 ambiguous as to what year the, this movie is filmed it's according to imdb said to have been released in 2017 made in 2017 released here in the states in of course 2018 but uh, according to a review i read by wesley morris of the new york times uh, portions of this film were were made in 2005 and this movie really doesn't give you any subtitles telling you what year it is or even what part of the country or of the world in which grace jones is performing but while that information probably would have helped it still is good verite cinema 
particularly because I think Grace Jones herself is so fascinating a figure, not to mention so striking and in her music and her style, that the, it, her presence definitely is all this movie really needs. But if somebody were to make a documentary about Grace Jones's life and career thus far from her start in the early 70s to where she is today, I would absolutely be into that that movie. And that's initially going in what I thought Grace Jones' Bloodlight and Bommy would be like, but fortunately, I, I was still very impressed by what I saw. I did think that the the footage that wasn't her concert footage got a little draggy from time to time because Verite Cinema is supposed to cast a non-judgmental light on its subject, which I appreciate. But then again, it almost felt like the director of the film, Sophie Fines, who is actually the sister of actors Rafe and Joseph Fines, in case you were curious, I thought she just basically put an iPad excuse me, an iPhone on a tripod and just push the button and let Grace Jones sometimes say whatever the hell she wanted to the camera. So sometimes, I think with Verite Cinema, it's it's a little bit of hit or miss. And there were some times where the documentary missed a little bit and where it dragged somewhat. But I did like actually a lot of the footage of her that was both on stage where she puts on a hell of a show and also backstage where interestingly enough grace jones herself chooses her own fashion stylings and does her own makeup even after all these years and i I really appreciated that part of the documentary grace jones blood light and bomb me and i think it's one of those documentary films that's up there with the Talking Heads Stop Making Sense, and also the bands The Last Waltz, in that not only will you be talking about the subject for years to come after seeing this film, you will most definitely be talking about the concert footage in this film, which is really the selling point of this movie. And I I really appreciated it. Yes, there were times where it got a little draggy. Yes, there were times where the movie could have used subtitles and maybe a few more interesting camera angles, but I really don't feel like faulting the film for all of that because, man, what a subject that they they cover here. Um, I, I certainly had a greater appreciation for Grace Jones after seeing this movie. And my familiarity with Grace Jones coming into this film, I knew who she was, and I'd seen her in movies like the James Bond film A View to a Kill and the Eddie Murphy film Boomerang, the latter of which she was very funny in, not to mention striking. But I had a greater appreciation for <clears throat> particularly her new wave music, which she still doing to this day and i don't think that artists especially more avant-garde artists like lady gaga have given grace jones the attention she deserves but whatever attention that grace jones deserves i think grace jones herself takes which is certainly evidence in this documentary which i'm giving my rating of a knockout i was certainly fascinated with all the great parts of this movie sure there were a few misses here and there but i hate to just reduce this movie to a checkout just because of those slight misses there are some misses but too few to to mention because the hits really hit in this film so i recommend grace jones bloodline bombing hope you enjoyed your meal and I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me. But I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. I love those real sixes. They're the ones that move me. The thinly blown neurotic toe. Intensify. 
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Amendment. This is a movie that I don't think anyone besides, or I, I know, I'm sure there are some people who've seen this film, but this was released temporarily into theaters a couple of weeks ago. At, uh, under the banner of Fathom Events. And Fathom Events are, of course, films that are released into theaters very momentarily, sometimes one or, or once or twice in theaters. And The Amendment was a film that was advertised so poorly that when I went to see it a couple of weeks ago on April 12th, I was literally the only person in the theater. And a lot of times when I'm the only person in the theater, it's it's a bit of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, I don't have to worry about any distractions from anybody who are who's talking or playing on their cell phone. But on the other hand, I'm thinking to myself, what? <laughs> Why am I the only one in here? What, did, did anyone else not find this movie particularly interesting? But The Amendment is a movie that is actually based on a true story. And it involves Brooks Douglas, who is a politician who actually made history in the early 90s by being Oklahoma's youngest state senator. Before he became o Oklahoma's youngest state senator, he had a pretty sordid past. Namely, he came from a functional family with um, two parents who were married and a sister. But unfortunately, he actually experienced what very few people in this world, if anyone, should experience. Specifically, his family was at one point in 1979 robbed by two drifters who entered their home, tied their family up, stole just $43, and then not only killed Brooks Douglas's parents, but also raped his youngest sister, who was 12 at the time. Uh, both of them raped her, and eventually the two were caught and sent to prison with one of them, uh, sur surprisingly not both of them, being put on death row. So the movie The Amendment stars Mike Vogel as Brooks Douglas as a young state senator, and Taryn Manning from Orange is the New Black as his younger sister. And the movie also features, interestingly enough, Brooks Douglas himself, the former uh, state senator, actually playing the role of his father in flashbacks. So this movie, unfortunately, has a great story behind it, but as I was watching it, it felt like a Lifetime TV movie. And I think that might have been what it was intended to be, but the, the camera... Um, what, the the filming of the the movie wasn't particularly great. I I expected uh, to, it to be in a lot better definition than what I was seeing in a movie theater. Now, if the movie was this quality on TV, I wouldn't have so much of a problem with it. But when I'm paying actually extra money, being a Fathom Events event. And seeing this movie on the big screen, I expected much better quality. The acting was pretty decent. I, I certainly thought that Taron Manning had the better performance in this film. And Mike Vogel was pretty decent. Uh, Brooks Douglas, I guess, did okay playing his father, who you'd probably know better than anyone else. But the, the problem for me was not the performances in the film as much as it was the method of them telling the story. For instance, the... The scene where the parents were murdered and the sister was ultimately taken into the other room and raped were toned down considerably. It's, according to the statement from Fathom Events, the crime scene is told gracefully but is not appropriate for children. See, the, the amendment was more like a PG-13 rated movie, but I thought in it being PG-13, it might have been a little bit more sanitized than it should have been. Of course, there's... It, it it did run the risk of being exploitative, but then again, when you have a, a a boy whose parents are murdered and his his sister is is raped, of course you're you're going to be 
you're going to have to show something rather than implying that something happened. And I also didn't like how the film cut back and forth between the present day, and by present day I mean 1990 or 1992 when this movie's taking place, and also the late 60s and early 70s showing the young Brooks Douglas with his parents, Dr. Richard Douglas, who was a uh, a pastor, and their their mother, Marilyn Sue Douglas. I thought there were some interesting anecdotes and also certainly some lessons in regards to magnanimity from Brooks Douglas's own father, which I thought served the the plot of the movie very well. But then again, the cutting back and forth, I, I didn't particularly appreciate. I thought it was one of those very showy and haughty things that first-time directors do. As a matter of fact, the amendment was so obscure when it, when it was released by Fathom Events that IMDb doesn't even have a page on the movie. So I, I, I feel like I was the only one who saw this film. I think it has an interesting message to it, but I just didn't think that releasing it into theaters was a particularly great idea. And I hate to fault this film being on a lower budget than most but at the same time it felt like a tv movie it felt sanitized like a tv movie it felt like they cut corners like a tv movie and everything looked a little too slick just like they usually do in a tv movie so this is a film that i'm going to give my rating of a strikeout to granted not all of it was bad but there were times where Things in the film, particularly the most gruesome elements of it, were told and not shown. And by the time they got around to the part where the young Brooks Douglas actually meets one of his killers in prison and begins his quest for magnanimity, I thought that part could have had a lot more power, but ultimately the film had a very missed opportunity. It also had a missed opportunity in the sense that it was distributed incorrectly by Fathom Events, who I usually like and respect for releasing certain direct-to-theater films like they do for a limited time, particularly the operas they have and also the the releasing of other classic films like Gone with the Wind or Grease. But here, the amendment felt to me like a little bit of a waste of time and certainly a waste of more money than I usually pay for movies. I'm a 40-year-old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma. It was very hard for me, but Miss Araceli, she gave me direction. At age 47, Marco finished his high school diploma. 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and now that I've reviewed the five movies I said I would review for this show, it's now time for me to get into my next segment, which is What's Coming Out Next. These are the big movies, unless otherwise specified, that are coming out in theaters near you this coming weekend. And it goes without saying that the biggest movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is... Drum roll, please. Avengers Infinity War. This is the 19th film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and this is and certainly not the last, but it might actually be the last Avengers movie, but again, I'm not saying that, but it's certainly working up to a major climax that has been in the works arguably since Iron Man came out in 2008 and definitely since the first Avengers movie came out in 2012. It is absolutely mind-blowing and extremely hard to believe that the Marvel Cinematic Universe has come this far without losing any steam, but I am I'm pretty excited to see this film and let me just give you a sense of 
the plot of this movie. The Avengers and their allies must be willing to sacrifice all in an attempt to defeat the powerful Thanos before his blitz of devastation and ruin puts an end to the universe. So, this movie has a ton of stars in it, most of whom are reprising their roles from previous Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, and this is the movie where they all come together. So, you have the Avengers, you have, which include Iron Man, <clears throat> The Incredible Hulk, Thor, Captain America, Scarlet Widow, and uh, Hawkeye, in addition to others. You also have Doctor Strange, um, Benedict Cumberpatch joining them. You have the Guardians of the Galaxy joining them. You have Black Panther joining them. You have the Winter Soldier joining them. This is yeah, going to be huge. Very, very huge. This is the first movie where all of them come together and this is a movie I can guarantee you I definitely will see this coming weekend and when I do, I will review it for you next week. So it seems like with a movie this huge coming out it almost seems like other movies pale in comparison. But, lo and behold there are actually other movies coming out this coming weekend and one of them is a film that will probably be in limited release. It's a movie called Kings. It's about the life of a foster family in South Central L.A. a few weeks before the city erupts in violence following the verdict of the Rodney King trial. This movie stars Halle Berry, Daniel Craig, Lamar Johnson, and Colleen Walker, amongst other people. This movie looks interesting. It's certainly about an interesting topic, and it's really hard to believe that it's been 26 years since the Rodney King riot to this month. But Kings is a movie that I definitely will see in theaters if it's out in theaters near me. And if I see it, I will let you know what I think next week. So the other films that are in this segment, what's coming up next, may or may not be coming out in a theater near you, let alone near me, but I'm going to read some of them off anyway. There's one starring Juliette Binoche called Let the Sunshine In, and it's about a Parisian artist by the name of Isabel, who is a divorced mother looking for love, true love, at last. It sounds kind of standard, but with Juliette Binoche in the title role, it, it might have some uh, some currency. It, it, it sounds a little bit like Chocolat without the uh, either the chocolate or the witchcraft, but uh, it's a movie I can't guarantee is going to be in a theater near me, but I'll look out for it. It's, it certainly looks interesting, and I do like Juliette Binoche. Another film that's coming out is one called Disobedience, which I have seen previews or parts of previews for since I'm kind of forced to see them, see them on YouTube, but I kind of close my eyes just in time. But this movie stars Rachel McAdams and Rachel Weiss. And it's about a woman who returns to the community that shunned her for her attraction to a childhood friend, who I presume is a woman. Once back, their passions reignite as they explore the boundaries of faith and sexuality. With Rachel McAdams and Rachel Weisz playing lovers, I'm already kind of in on this movie. So that's a movie that looks interesting. I can't guarantee whether or not it's going to be a theater near me, but it, <laughs> it, it sounds enticing, it sounds erotic, but it might be very serious Lars von Trier levels of movie drama. But in any event, it looks interesting. I'll see if it's in a theater near me, and I will let you know what I think when I, if I review the movie. But in the meantime, that just about does it for this week's edition of Words on Film. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I am, of course, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just as a reminder, Words on Film, the views and opinions expressed on it, are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, whether they're about movies or any other topic. The views and opinions expressed on, the f on this show do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working for the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. Another reminder, you are listening, you have been listening to Words on Film on BostonFreeRadio.com, watching it on Scat V or some community access TV station around there, or you've been watching and listening on Facebook Live. Either way, you could join me. This is Dan Burke saying thank you, and I'll see you at the movies.